Welcome to Linked Up, Breaking Boundaries in Education, a podcast that focuses on what is happening in education today, connecting everyone to the movers and shakers that are breaking boundaries in the education arena. Welcome to Linked Up, Breaking Boundaries in Education. We love when we have someone come back, and this time it is a person coming back, but he's new and different because now he's an author. So I'm looking forward to hearing all about his new book that I have right here. Yes. 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 yes our guest today is Michael Salvatore. And, you know, remember, Jamie, he was our very first guest. On That's right. Podcast. He was number one. Number one. And he's still number one in our books. I'll right. tell you. Michael, since that first podcast, you have changed positions professionally and you've become an author. Tell us about that. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. I don't know if I'm new and different, though, Jamie, but I, maybe I am. Maybe yeah. uh, I didn't. Um, so uh, what number episode are are you uh Oh, my God. I think we're at 135-ish, something like that. Yeah. So it was 134 episodes ago. So uh, yes. when, we first, when we first talked, I believe I was still uh, superintendent of schools so the city of Long Branch. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I believe we were still amidst that terrible pivot that we all had right so right um, and now uh for the past three years i've been working in higher education which is uh it feels a lot like k-12 but so many different exciting things happening there uh so i'm uh, serving as the senior vice president of administration at Kane university and that's a, a that's certainly a fun spot tom you did actually join us for another podcast in this role we had uh kevin mccoy and you that's did- right on innovation in higher ed, so mm-hmm. you've actually been back in this role too. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's great. So the the authorship piece is uh, it's kind of what higher ed folks do. Actually, you know they they write books, they publish or perish. That's the uh, the terminology. So uh, I I made it a point last summer that you know, we've got like a hundred some days of summer vacation. I'm going to write every single day, and that's what I did. I just woke up, enjoyed my back porch and some coffee, and committed to putting uh, about 25 years of thoughts into writing. And uh, as, as you both know, because you've had a chance to glance or read yeah. some of the book. Yeah. Well, okay. So that's interesting that you said it's basically you are taking all of your educational experience and putting this into this book because you, what I love about you is your journey. I love the, it's, it's one thing that you are a preschool teacher, which is amazing, but a male in a preschool teacher role is so fantastic. So I love that unique perspective that you had. And that's actually with this book, Inside Out, Social Emotional Leadership, Dr. Michael Salvatore. That's what this, the foundation of this is on, isn't it? The practices, the best practices in pre-K education, right? A few years ago, uh, everybody started talking about social emotional learning in schools, right? And it became like these, this cliche, this like phrase, um, and I was laughing because anybody who's worked in early childhood education has been talking about this for 20 what? years. This social emotional domain was always a factor that we had to uh, develop lessons around, made sure that we were uh, focusing on self-regulatory practices for three and four year olds. So I, it kind of tickled me. And I thought, wow, these principles that we're talking about, specifically the Castle Five principles, they are like they could be applied to any setting for anybody, whether you're a CEO of a company, an executive, uh, an industry, or and certainly an educational leader. Absolutely. And as I was reading through the book, you know, I've read a lot of leadership books in my day. And the thing that is great about this book is you take all of these golden nuggets and you just bring them together in one place. For instance, The Castle, Eckhart Tolle, who I love, JFK, Haifas and Lewinsky, you just bring them all in, even breathing techniques. It's its really a one-stop shop for yeah. leadership, I think. So many leadership authors just talk about one thing and you get a little bit bored with it. You don't get bored with your book. It well, has I, so many I, facets to it. I appreciate you saying that because... I think we we all we're all readers, and you know uh, right. we're all reading our our peers and what they're publishing. 
And, you know, good book for me is when I, I can go back and, and I can remember a piece of it, whether it be a story or a strategy. But a, a really great book is to be able to remember a story and a strategy, even if it's just one where you're saying, I'm going to use this whenever. So uh, I've had people approach me about several of the strategies in the book, you know, oh. whether it be time boxing, whether it be belly breathing, any, anything in there. Um, they all apply because they're designed to enhance you as a person, which makes you a better leader overall. That's another point that I want to make about your book. So many of the things that you talk about are basic things that we can do. We don't have to go out and buy something or buy right. a new program or download an app, like the breathing skills. And, you know, you're just, oh, reflection, taking time to reflect. It's just part of the human experience that we all get too busy being busy that we don't do. Well, you, you know, I think a big piece that I, I write about is um, I was one of those people, and occasionally I still am, uh, who wore lack of sleep as a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. I would be yeah. like, I only slept four hours last night, and oh, like I am so great, and I'm still functioning. Yeah. Uh, then I, I think we're all learning a lot about how important sleep is. Right. Uh, and um, identifying that it's it's like a loss of IQ essentially for every hour or less that you sleep. So the decision making, especially if you're a, a school leader, you're making decisions all day. Your uh, ability to make quality decisions on lack of sleep, it, it suffers tremendously. Right. And I, I was uh, blown away when I was doing research on sleeping and I found uh, Shonda Rhimes' book, uh, Year of Yes. I, I never read that until I stumbled upon it and said, I've got to peruse this book. And, you know, Shonda, she's, you know, she's written everything. She's produced everything. I mean, she's, yes. she's a winner at life. And, um, and an extraordinary leader in her field. So I was like, well, what is she doing? And she talks about a sleep routine. I'm like, listen, she is somebody who's busy, like busy 12 hours a day. But she talks about the importance of her sleep and setting a routine prior. And it's like you said, Jerry, it's simple. Put the phone down, everybody. Put it down an hour before you're going to go to bed. Right. You know, set the lighting, put some, do take a, take a shower, bath, whatever it is for you. Like prepare a routine as if you would prepare a routine to start a big meeting or a day because it's more important than that meeting uh, and it's going to put you at a, at a whole nother level. So um, that's something I've been trying to do. I, I actually get rid of the badge of honor, try to sleep seven hours a night mm -hmm. and then try to have the best day possible uh, based yeah. You know, I think it's interesting because you just mentioned the Shonda Rhimes book and it did have an influence on you. Um, the last podcast that you joined us for, you mentioned uh, the book Atomic Habits. Did that book also have an influence on, obviously did on your life, but how about on your book? Yeah, as you uh, fumble through the pages, you'll, 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 you'll find James Clear in there. Uh, so th that book is great, not only just for me, but it's uh, so many built-in strategies and habits. And, and actually what I'll reference in there are some professional athletes who've adopted those practices, whether it be uh, the superstar Steph Curry, the three-point phenomenon. Like he, he understands habits. This guy is out there, uh, you know, shooting, form shooting every day, yet he's still the best shooter in the league, you know. Uh, um, he's not the only, like it's, it's athletes, it's professionals, it's the, that habit forming techniques are, are critical. So, um, and you, you can be more productive with it. Uh, certainly. So yeah, I, I reference him uh, quite a few times throughout the book as well. Oh, I love it. I love it. I mean, it really is just so important. And I think just the, the basic foundation, as you described it, that is part of this book, uh, and part of your preschool educator experience is just, it really is so important mm -hmm. and also allows for people to kind of stop and realize, let's get back to the basics. And I can do this. These are things that I can do um, in my role as a leader, whether it be in, um, you know, in school, in a district, in higher ed, or even anywhere, really, um, and really take these practices and leverage them in those roles. I just think it, it's so basic, yet it's so uh, it, impactful at the same time. Well, you, you know what happens in leadership is that you uh, you often put yourself last. And, and actually, it's just part of the trade of education. They are people who are about helping other people. And eventually, they get to themselves, which is 
problematic. But in, in this book, so what I'm trying to break down is this real self-awareness of who you are. You know, what are things that make you feel really good? What are environments that allow you to learn at your, your peak level? Um, what, are your, what are your triggers? What are some things that annoy you? What, whether it be in people, what are environments that are unproductive? So uh, it's, a, it's a real, um, I'm really promoting people to understand who they are because without that foundation of, of what really may motivate you, what inspires you and what can throw you off path, if you don't understand that, then you're not going to be able to uh, negotiate or navigate those waters. The, the second piece to that is the self-management piece. And I think this is critical. Um, like we taught, like this was something three-year-olds struggle with. Um, I remember like, you know, you give a three-year-old, uh, you pair them up, you give two three-year-olds, you give one a card that has an ear on it and one a card that has lips on it. And the, the lips signified that you can talk and the ear was that you should be listening. And this simple practice that three-year-olds eventually really understand and get, yeah, this self-regulatory practice, I sometimes wish I had those in boardrooms. I wish I had those in, in divisional meetings where you can pass them across the table. Oh, it's your turn now to talk and your turn to listen. Um, I, I, I feel like if, if people understood that element, the importance of being a listening leader, um, and then also the importance of not, um, of sharing the air, of not hogging it. Like we, we have that piece too. And, and I say that because the self-regulatory piece has concerned me a lot. Um, during COVID, I think it was, um, it was a spotlight on it because we saw superintendents going viral for the wrong reasons. Right. We saw, uh, we saw somebody with the weight of the, the world on their shoulders who was trying to make really good decisions for a community, not just, uh, the students, for the full educational community and, and people broke in right. public in, in a not very nice way. Mm -hmm. uh, some of their careers ended because of that. So uh, my hope was uh, with this book is to understand that social emotional leadership is an approach. It's something, it's not a one strategy. It's, it's not a belief. It's an approach to how you conduct yourself, mm -hmm. how you regulate your emotions, how you manage that how you're socially aware, how you build relationships and make decisions. It's, it's all of those things in one. And my, my true hope is that somebody reads this book and it allows them to take a deep breath before responding in yeah. one of those moments where someone's cell phone is out and it's really the wrong time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I say this all the time. It's so important to take that time to respond and not react. Because most often we are reacting and that's where the trouble starts happening. So I think, you know, what's happening in your book is bringing people to that, um, that aware, that self-awareness so that they can practice these skills regularly so that when those moments come where we would typically react, they can step back and do that, that careful response instead. It, it's the Steph Curry effect. It's like he practices form shooting so that when he's in a game, he does not have to think exactly. about shooting, right. Right. you know, right. so he can right. think about right. the court. He can think about where people are. He doesn't have to think about shooting because it comes natural. And you're right. When the pressure comes and maybe you're weak because it's 7 p.m. and you've been at work for 14 hours or whatever, you know, take the deep breath. You know, uh, find a strategy that pulls you down, whether it's one of those box strategies or something else. So, yeah, I, I agree. I think far too many, um, far too many leaders are um, they're being approached in a very weak part of their day, or, or and they need strategies to be able to kind of avoid that and preserve their leadership and, and their effect on the community. Oh, leaders they sometimes think that they need to be heard. And that it's an expectation. And so listening isn't always something that they're looking for to listen because I need people to hear me. I need them to hear my vision. I need them to hear what's going on. And so the listening piece gets put to the side. I think it's so important that we focus on it. You know, one example I, I put in the book was it was really around um, was like Tim Cook's response for Apple. And I, I didn't want to overly focus on Apple because everybody does, right? But his response uh, around the, the social unrest was awesome. It's a model for every leader. 
he went around and talked to everybody, people who look different than he did so he can get a unique perspective. People had a completely yes. different job, one that he never had but his, in his organization. And it was he able to kind of hear those insights. And it helped him frame a response that I thought was a, a genius memo uh, that was advertised all over the world. Uh, and it showed that he was a true listening leader. And he was able to capture their insights and show that the changes he was going to make in his organization were a result of their voices. And that's, that's exactly what everybody has to do. That's what great leaders do. You know, this is for leaders. This is for adults. But you do have three kids. Two of them are going off to college. How, how do you think that college kids actually could benefit from reading this book? It's a, it's a good question because um, one of the things I was flattered about is they actually went and bought my book. Oh, they, oh, that's so cute. They, like, so, and, and my wife said to me, she said, you know, the, the boys bought your book. Oh I said, God. what do you mean they bought it? Like, I have a box here. Have a box yeah. here. So <laughs> one of them bought it off Barnes & Noble, and the other one uh, yeah. typed it inside out and bought it, bought it off um, Amazon. They used your credit card, by the way. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they did. Uh, but, but you know, this is, uh, as we talked about in the beginning, this is, these are strategies that are applicable to everybody. So whether you're 18 and dealing with yeah. the pressures of uh, choosing a college, or it's just a way to kind of de-stress in the moment, uh, put good habits to work, and, and kind of maximize your day with good routines. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that you bring up, besides listening, that I really like to hear about is self-reflection. Do you have a way that you self-reflect or a process that you use? That's a good question, Jerry, because I think that's so hard. And I don't think it's hard. time to do that. It's like they're done, move on. But it is. It's not easy. Yeah. Right. Uh, So the first thing I would recommend is time box it. And I've used that as a... uh, a strategy to kind of get the things done during the day you need. But if you don't plug it in to yeah. your schedule to do uh-huh. it, you will miss it. And, and here's the importance of this is that when you don't reflect upon a topic, you will lose details on it just because yeah. that's what our, that's what we do. Uh-huh. We just kind of, things come and they, they, and you might not even need that information today, but a month from now, something comes up and because you didn't reflect upon it accurately, you're going to miss key details yeah. from that. And you may really need that information. So a reflection needs to be a habit. Um, And whether it be on your hour-long commute home where you're reflecting on your day, because um, we all, listen, as we get older, right, our eyes go, our ears go, but, you know, we forget things too. Um, So if the more we reflect, the more we can capture important information that occurred during a particular meeting, whether it be a body language whether it be a tone somebody had that you may miss if you don't reflect upon that, um, or just um, who was at the table? Was I equitable in my approach to get, gather insights? You know, did I invite the right people to the table to discuss this issue? Reflecting upon that allows you to correct it, but also capture keen insights that you may need tomorrow or a month from now down the road. Yeah. And you'll be glad you time boxed it. When you need uh, it. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Time boxing just a little bit for people that are not familiar with it. What do you mean by that? Sure. So um, uh, it's uh, probably most notably, uh, not, not that he's the best example of it, but uh, it's been discussed that Elon Musk is, is somebody who routinely time boxes. Uh, and he does it as, at an absurd level. Like he does it every five minutes once a goal achieved in his life. So if he's speaking oh. in an hour interview, he's got 12 topics that he wants to accomplish before the end of that. Uh, I would say um, the most appropriate, the most appropriate uh, way to time box is to take your calendar, divide it up into four boxes with four major goals that you want to have that day. Uh, you usually have to do a, a brain dump before that to say, what are all the things that are important to me, for me that I have to get done today? You, you throw that all out on the table and then you synthesize that down to four actionable items that force you to sit down and get that done. If it's a four-day project, you time box it for four consecutive days between 10 and 12. No interruptions, you get it done. Uh, I, I think this is critical. This is how you get things done. This is how you're productive because what I found is uh, when I was a principal early on, I wanted to be the best principal ever. I wanted to train every teacher. I wanted to have book studies. I wanted, I really had such lofty aspirations. 
And six months into the job, and I'm everywhere, but everything I wanted to do wasn't done. I was doing lunch duty and, and pick up. Uh, I was at the uh, line for dismissal. I was touring the hallways, getting in every class every day. But the things I really thought were awesome about leadership, I wasn't able to get to you. So I, I shifted my mindset at that point and said, I've got to put this in my schedule mm. to make sure that I'm developing yep. our faculty, that I'm sharing data, that I'm putting uh, an effort to not only just visit classrooms, but look with a keen eye and provide good feedback. So it, it helped me shift my experience as a principal from being just somebody who goes through a routine every day to somebody who actually goes through a routine, but also is productive and gets things done that are innovative. How often do you do it? Every day. That's how my calendar works. Yeah. So and so I, I my job now currently uh, involves overseeing three major divisions in one uh, office of diversity, equity, inclusion. And those divisions are student affairs, huge division. Enrollment service is huge and strategic analytics. I've got to box those things in. Yes. I've got to box in time in those offices. Uh, I mean, the just the reporting alone structure, and then any innovation uh, that we have, we time box that in too. So whether we're writing together, planning together, studying together, you know, we 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 make sure that's that's labeled in our calendar as a goal. Yeah, right. it's got to be. And I I do the same thing because otherwise it just gets filled up with meetings, and then you're talking about stuff and not actually doing stuff. So I always block it out, and I color code too because that helps me too. I like the colors. Yes. And you, and you feel productive. I, I mean, yes. when you you finish a day, even if you even if you finish a, a section of something you wanted to, you feel you feel productive. I mean, yeah. and why shouldn't you, as a leader, as an employee, why should you feel productive? You shouldn't just be patting everybody else on the back. You need to feel good about what you're doing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have to tell you, I was having a wonderful conversation with my husband last night. But then he wasn't actually responding to me. And I looked over and, you know, it is common that I get ignored. But I was getting ignored because he was deep in this last night. So, yeah, it was wonderful. Fantastic. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. I, I don't know if I want to use that as the token story to, to promote the <laughs> That's right. Wow. Ignore your it. wife and read my book. <laughs> right. Yeah. Michael, I'm just really thrilled about this and we did just have michael on we did a um an event called linking leaders um higher ed summit and we did it in austin alongside south by southwest edu and michael came and we had a great what was your panel your panel was um innovation creating a culture innovation of innovation in higher ed. yeah in innovation higher ed. yep and then oh, we good. Came out and everyone was so thrilled so we'll continue to do more I hope together because it's just, it's a gift. It's so wonderful. It really is. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. It was, uh, it was great being with you again and hope to see you both soon. I do right. too. Very nice. Thank you for listening. And if you would like to stay linked up, be sure to follow us on Apple and Spotify and subscribe to us on YouTube.